In the last period, we had looked at Protestantism in America. And we saw how even though the Puritans and people that followed fled from persecution in Europe, they were still not learning the lesson that the conscience of the individual is above the decrees of rulers and of magistrates and of clerics and people are to follow God according to the dictates of their own conscience and they are wholly responsible before God for what they believe. There is a separation of church and state and the individual's conscience relates to the religious experience and he is accountable to God. Now if in the process he infringes in the civil rights of another person, then the civil part is to take um, action. But they are only to punish him for his incivility and not for his, irreligi uh, his lack of following religious rules. Okay? So let's say somebody was following a, a, a certain law to keep a certain day of the week. If they choose to keep another day, or if the majority chooses to keep another day, they should never come to him and say, you must keep the day that we want, because it's a religious duty. And there's no way to make Sunday sacredness a civil duty. It just doesn't fit. And to, to prove that point, just read that book, The National Sunday Law by A.T. Jones. You will see how there's just no way. Through history, it has always been religious. So if the state and the church are separate, the state cannot force a Sunday legislation and still say that it's forcing a, a civil duty. Okay? Sunday can never be put as a civil duty for the sake of um, sacredness. Okay, so we saw that, and we saw that as the Constitution of the United States came about, and as people realized their freedoms, they established civil and religious freedom as part of the fundamental law of the land. Right? So the churches grew, and by freedom of religion, people were able to follow the dictates of their own conscience. But as the time passed, the churches were becoming more and more like the world. The prospect of you know, discoveries and uh, the Industrial Revolution and the money that was available and the freedom that were available made people uh, have uh, a condition that they could rather choose to be asleep religiously and just use the forms of religion. So, in that situation, we, we will come to the, the points that we're to follow here in the next few slides. <coughs> so, Christ had bidden his people to watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the token of their coming king. When these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Luke 21, 28, 30, and 31. So we saw some signs that had been predicted. The third of these signs we haven't seen yet but I'm just putting the date there for you. But the first, the first two happened on the same day, the day and the night, right? The sun was darkened as Christ predicted in Matthew 24. The moon became red as blood as Christ predicted in Matthew 24. And both of these signs happened in May 19th, 1780. So Christ was saying, when you see these things come to pass, rejoice because your redemption draweth nigh. 
But as the spirit of humility and devotion in the church had given place to pride and formalism, love for Christ and faith in His coming had grown cold. People were not really expecting the coming of Jesus anymore. And the reason was, there was pride in the church. When pride takes possession, it removes our focus from Christ and it puts our focus on self. That's all. And self, or pride, is what took Satan out of heaven. He was the highest angel, created angel, right? In heaven. He was a created being, I'm sorry. He was the highest created being in heaven. Remember, God is not created. So, of all the creatures, all, of everything that was created by God, Satan was the highest. But because of pride, he was kicked out. And God will not tolerate pride in any of us. Because pride is self-destructing. And it contaminates the universe. It's the opposite of the law of heaven. This morning... Um, uh, my wife mentioned to me um, the law of the universe. She asked me, do you know what the law of the universe is? And I remember reading it. So I said, to give. And, and then she said, yeah, to give. I was trying to remember to give what? But she said, to give. That's the law of the universe. Everything gives. Christ gave his life. There's only one thing in the universe that doesn't give. is the selfish human heart. It just takes, takes, takes. It doesn't give. It's all for self, nothing for others, you know. So the goal that God has with us is to change our hearts completely. Give us a new heart that will be selfless. It will be unselfish, right? Because selfishness is the opposite of the law of the universe. Okay, and then... She continues here in Great Controversy 309. Absorbed in worldliness and pleasure-seeking, the professed people of God were blinded to the Savior's instruction concerning the signs of His appearing. So they saw the signs coming, but they weren't really seeing it. They were blinded. The doctrine of the Second Advent had been neglected. The scriptures relating to it were obscured by misinterpretation until it was to a great extent ignored and forgotten. Especially was this the case in the churches of America. So imagine all the churches here, and none of them are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. The coming of Jesus, the second coming, they're not waiting. The freedom and comfort they're enjoyed by, uh, uh, the freedom and comfort enjoyed by all classes of society the ambitious desire for wealth and luxury, begetting an absorbing devotion to money-making, the eager rush for popularity and power, which seemed to be within the reach of all, led men to center, to center their interests and hopes on the things of this life, and to put far in the future that solemn day when the present order of things should pass away. Were they waiting for Christ? Yeah, they were waiting. But way in the future, they were saying, oh no, that's far away. There will be a thousand years before Jesus comes. So let's just enjoy it. That's what they were thinking. right? They were thinking that the millennium would come before the coming of Jesus. So the condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's words in Revelation, thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. What church is that? Sardis. Is the church, is the sixth church out of the seven churches, you know, Revelation 2 and 3. So the sixth church is Philadelphia. It was the church right before the church of Laodicea. So it says, Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. 
And to those who refuse to arouse from their careless security, the solemn warning is addressed. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So Jesus was warning the church that if they didn't watch, they would be left out. It would be like a thief in the night. So, God was wanting to save the church and to awake the church. He didn't want the churches to be at a loss. So, to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of His professed people were not building for eternity. And in His mercy, He was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. Do you see why God sent the three angels' messages? What was the purpose? It was to arouse the church that had been asleep. And it was in His mercy that He did that. He wanted to prepare them to meet Christ. But they were not ready. So He said, I will send them the warning message. And that warning message is found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, right? 6 through 12. So this warning is brought to view in Revelation 14. Here is a threefold message represented as proclaimed by heavenly beings and immediately followed by the coming of the Son of Man to reap the harvest of the earth. Do you see how they prepare the people? Because right after them, He reaps the harvest. So there's a preparation that takes place by these messages. The prophet beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. What is the angel announcing? What is this here? People talk about the gospel. Gospel. But I think there's a misunderstanding of what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news. But there are many things that can be news, and many of them can be good. But not because they're good in their news, they have to be the gospel, right? If I got a good, a brand new car, and I tell my wife that I, I was you know, given this car on a, you know, <laughs> by, by my friend, that would be good news, but it wouldn't be the gospel. We can say, you know, God loves humanity. That's true. But... The gospel is not restricted to that idea, just that God loves humanity. There is something more to it. When Jesus came, He began to preach the gospel. And what was the, one of the first things that He said? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? right. So... They were to believe the gospel. Repent, repent, repent. That was the message. John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, they all preached repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So when this angel comes in the midst of heaven and he preaches the gospel, he has the everlasting gospel, what comes out of his mouth as he begins to speak? Fear God. Fear God. And give glory to Him for what? The hour of His judgment is come. And the Bible calls this the everlasting gospel. The hour of God's judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth 
in the sea and the fountains of waters. The angel was represented as going through the midst of heaven, but were those angels who preached the message? Who announced this? It was men, right? So the message is being portrayed as an, uh, preached by an angel in the midst of heaven because of the, the breadth and width and the extent of its proclamation. There were people around the world preaching this. How many have heard of Joseph Wolf? How many have read the Great Controversy? Joseph Wolf is there. He was the missionary to the world, right? He went to many different countries. He even preached in the, in the Congress of the United States. He went to Africa, to Europe, to Asia, and he went to a place that was um, in Yemen, and he found there people that were still descendants of a certain group from the Bible, the Rechabites. Do you remember the Rechabites? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Rechabites? So Joseph Wolf was there with the Rechabites, which was from the time of the prophet Jeremiah, is that right? The prophet Isaiah. Anyway, one of these two. I think it was Jeremiah. God told the prophet, give wine to these Rechabites. And he came and gave wine to them. And they said, we will not drink it. Our father has told us not to drink and we won't. And God said to the prophet, how can this be? They obeyed their father, but you don't obey me, which am your father. So God was using them as an object lesson. And um, Joseph Wolf found them in the 1840s, 1830s, I think, in Yemen. And they had possession of a, a certain book. They were still not drinking wine. They were still following their father's command. Jonadab, the son of Rechab. So they were in possession of a book called Sira. In that book, it was said that Christ was coming very soon. And they were expecting the coming of Jesus to be around the year 1840 or 40s, 42 it was soon. So around the world, people were waiting for this message. There was another man called uh, Lacunza. How many have heard of Lacunza? Manuel Lacunza. Yes? It's also in the Great Controversy. And he was in South America. If I'm not, for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was from Chile. He was a Jesuit. But he understood that Jesus was coming soon. And he wrote a book about the coming of Jesus. Can you believe that? And the book was called La Venida del Messias en Gloria y Majestad. The coming of the Messiah in glory and majesty. But he was afraid of putting his name in the book, I think. <laughs> so he... That might be the reason. Because he, he just published with a pseudonym. With a, another name. He... He used the name uh, Juan Josafat Ben Ezra, like a Jewish name. And there were other people that were preaching the message around the world. In America, the message was preached to many places by William Miller, Joseph Bates. Did you know Joseph Bates was also preaching? We will see as, the, as we, we continue in this. But Joseph Bates was one of the preachers as well. He went to the southern states to preach. And people said that he was going to be killed because he was an abolitionist. You know what abolitionist is? It's, um, he wanted to end the slavery. He wanted to free the, the slaves. And the southern states were still holding to slavery. So people told him, don't go there because you will die. 
They will kill you. They know you're an abolitionist. And he wasn't afraid. He went there. And he didn't die. God protected him. They tried to kill him, though. So, faithful men who were obedient to the promptings of God's Spirit and the teachings of His Word were to proclaim this warning to the world. They were those who had taken heed to the sure word of prophecy, the light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise. They had been seeking the knowledge of God more than all hid treasures, counting it better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof that find gold. And the Lord revealed to them the great things of the kingdom. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. He will show them His covenant. Now this is amazing here, if you, if you think about it. Who were the preachers? Faithful men. Isn't that what we read? Faithful men. Now look at this. It was not the scholarly theologians who had an understanding of this truth and engaged in its proclamations. I feel, I feel so sad many times because of the confidence that we put in people and the lack of confidence we have in inspiration. It just shocks me. We tend to look at scholars, scientists, theologians, and follow what they say. That's what we tend to do. But a, a thus saith the Lord many times does not convince us. But it should be the other way around. The scholars, the theologians, and the scientists should be tested by the, by the thus saith the Lord, right? Isn't that so? What do you think? Do you know why I say that? The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. If the whole world was arraigned against God and just saying that what He says is false, that wouldn't make it false. Because let God be true and every man a liar, right? It's only when we say what God says that we can be true. If we say what He doesn't say, if He says something, we say something else, we can only be lying because God is true, right? So, not the scholarly theologians engaged in this proclamation. In fact, if you look at this man here, you will see that he was not a scholarly man. We will have more on him later on. But let's just think a little bit about what it's saying here. Had these been faithful watchmen, who? The scholars, right? Diligently and prayerfully searching the scriptures, they would have known the time of the night. The prophecies would have opened to them the events about to take place. But they did not occupy this position. And the message was given by humbler men. So what did the scholars miss? What were they not here? Faithful watchmen, they were not. They were not diligently and prayerfully studying or searching the scriptures, right? But they were scholars. So they could not know the time of the night. When the question was asked, watchmen, what of the night? Watchmen, what of the night? They didn't have a clue. So humbler men had to give the message. Said Jesus, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. Those who turn away from the light which God has given, or who neglect to seek it when it is within their reach, are left in darkness. But the Savior declares, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Whoever is with singleness of purpose seeking to do God's will, earnestly heeding the light already given, will receive greater light. To that soul, some star of heavenly radiance will be sent to guide him into all truth. So let's look a little bit at 
this man here. His name, William Miller. He was the person wh whose name was given to that group that were expecting the coming of Jesus, the Millerites, right? Or in other words, they were following the explanations that William Miller was giving based on the biblical study, right? But who would follow a man like this? He was not a scholar, nor a theologian, nor a pastor. He wasn't a physician. What was he? He was a farmer. And he was from uh, New York, right? There's a farm, his farm in New York. You can go there and visit today. Miller's farm is in up, upstate New York. So he was a farmer. He had the, the posture of a farmer, but he was very intelligent, very studious, and very honest. So he began to study the Bible in a different way than most of us do. He decided not to move to the next verse until he understood the previous verses. So he decided to get all the ideas and understand them and not just pass as, you know, sometimes do. Oh, I didn't understand this, but let me keep going because I need to finish, you know. So what would he do when he came to a, a verse that he didn't understand? What, what was the method that he chose? Do you remember? He would pray, that's right. And he would take a concordance. You know what's a concordance? It's just a, a book that shows you the words from the Bible and where those same words appear elsewhere. Okay? So the concordance. Cruden's concordance. So he, he would go to the concordance and let's say he was studying about, you know, um, creation. And he reads there, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he wanted to learn more about creation. So he would look for the word creation or created elsewhere in the Bible. All the verses. Because his understanding was that the Bible explains itself, right? So if the Bible explains itself, what can be the way to, to find the answers? Is to search for the words, same words. So he would search for that same word everywhere and he would get a clear picture like of the whole of what it meant, right? Based on that, he came to very amazing conclusions. You can read more about him in this book here, The Great Second Advent Movement. It speaks a lot about him there. There's another book called um, William... Uh, Memoirs of William Miller by Sylvester Bliss. Memoirs of William Miller. That talks a lot about him as well. So his method of studying the Bible is what gave us the understanding that in prophecy, one day equals what? One year. year. One year. One day equals one year. There was another man there, uh, Joseph Bates. He also was preaching to the, as I said, to the southern states. He was a sea captain and he decided to, to study more the Bible. He gave his life to Jesus and then he, he went back to the states, sold his ship and entered into a more, um, a deeper study of the Bible, deeper consecration to God until he found out about the Advent message. And then he really dedicated his life to preaching and to, to writing. We will learn a lot more about him later on, but I recommend this book to you, The Autobiography of Elder Joseph Bates. These are all books that are available for free online. You can download them for free, and they are in audio as well. Go to lmiaudio.org. All the way to the bottom there, there is the, the Pioneer section, Adventist Pioneer section. And you can download these, these audiobooks for free. So, you see here William Miller preaching. He was a farmer, but he preached with so much power 
that people were amazed. There was one time that he was invited to preach in a certain church. The pastor of that church went to receive William Miller in the, at the train station. And he went with his chariot or carriage. As he got there and he saw, and he saw Miller's, um, you know, de not deportment. So as he got there and he saw the way Miller was dressed and his appearance, he thought, no way, this man will be a disaster in my church, you know. So he was ashamed of William Miller because he thought, this man is not a scholar, he's not a theologian. I was told that he was a great preacher, but look at him, he, he, he looks like a simple man, a farmer. How, can, how is he going to preach in my church? My church is more you know, elevated, polite or whatever, or highly uh, studied, whatever. You know, people that go there are higher. How will they accept this man? So he was ashamed. And he decided to show that he was ashamed. Right? So because he had already invited, he didn't you know, send him back. But as they went to the church, and as they were going forward to the front, um, the pastor didn't accompany William Miller to the front, to the pulpit. He just sat in one of the pews and waited. He thought, I'm not going to make a fool of myself here. So he was just watching. And very, everybody knew that he was not happy with it, right? But as Miller began to preach, it was so powerful. It was with such manifest demonstration of the Spirit of God that the pastor changed his mind. And you know what he did? He went, he got up from his seat, his chair, in the pews there, and he went to the front, to the place where he should have been in the beginning, and he sat by William Miller. <laughs> He understood this man is from God. Yeah. It's amazing how we judge people by the appearance. But as we see here, the message of Revelation 6, verse 7 says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. What was Miller's preaching? I mean, in which verse, if we can point one verse in the Bible, was his preaching based on? If there was one text, it's Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, right? Yeah. So that's the, that's right. That's the verse that was the, the leading verse, the, the main verse that he based his preaching on. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But notice it talks about days. But remember, in Miller's study, he understood that a day in prophecy equals a year. And what are the Bible verses that we can show for that? A day in prophecy equals a year. Numbers 14, verse 34. Forty days each day for a year. In Ezekiel 4, verse 6. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Right? Some Bibles have in, in verse 7, Ezekiel 4, verse 7, and some in verse 6. So I have appointed thee each day for a year. So, based on that, when we look at time prophecies, we must understand one day in time prophecy equals one year. That's the rule. If we understand that, then we can apply the the prophetic periods and understand how they fulfilled in history, right? So one uh, literal year in prophetic time is one day. 1260 literal years in prophetic time are three and a half prophetic times or 42 months or 1260 prophetic days. And 2300 literal years in prophetic time Equal, equal 
2,300 prophetic evenings and mornings, or 2,300 days. We will have to continue this later, because this is a whole um, lecture by itself. But we will look at the fulfillment of the sixth trumpet and see how it happened that it was fulfilled in, in an, an amazing way. And it convinced many of the people of the world that Miller's method of interpretation was correct. This happened to prove that his method was correct. And we will look at that um, in more details in the next class. So it was found out by Josiah Litch based on Revelation 9.15. If you read the verse, it says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. That is amazing. Based on that verse, and the understanding they had of prophecy and history, he was able to predict the fall of the Ottoman Empire in August 11, 1840. He gave the day. And we will see that in the next class. Okay? Um, so, let's be prepared. If you can, review the, the few chapters in Great Controversy that talk about this. Uh, take from chapter, the one that says, A Great Religious Awakening, and then An American Reformer, and um, A Warning Rejected. Look at those, and we will discuss them more in the next class.